Welcome to Civil Discourse, a podcast where participants are free to share their ideas, empathize with other perspectives, and who intend to advance to a better solution to fix a societal ill. We will focus on topics that are particularly complicated. In a time where information is from sources more opinionated than ever, our mission is to find solutions and goals to accelerate the nation's progress with cultural impunity. I'm your host, Todd Furness. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm really excited about today's guest and looking forward to our conversation. Before I do that, just a few housekeeping uh, matters to take care of. Uh, if you like these videos, please like, share, or subscribe, or ideally all three. Uh, and of course, I have my book out, which is called The 60% Solution, Rethinking Healthcare. Uh, today, we have uh, a guest that I've, I've had a chance to speak to a few times and uh, really excited about seeing how his work comes to fruition and what it does for the marketplace. So we have as our guest, Leo Wisniewski. And Leo, I just want to tee it up and, and have folks learn a little about you and what you're trying to do and, and why you're so passionate about that. So let's, let's start with not where you come from. Tell me why you're so passionate about what you do. You're investing a tremendous amount of your time and your personal treasure to go make this uh, business ambition a reality. Tell us kind of what, what's driving your, your mission. Sure. So, so I used to work at a Blue Cross and where I had visibility into the claims data. And I saw clear, low-cost pathways in the claims data. And sadly, those pathways were not being used. And it, 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 as a result, it was tremendous waste. You know, people go into expensive doctors or doctors who are doing fraud, billing abuse. It was all avoidable with transparency and and I'd seen low cost care pathways. And and I brought this this information, these reports to the management and they didn't use them. They they didn't want to provide an abrasion. They were happy with the status quo because you know they were getting their bonuses, they had big salaries. But the cause of that was healthcare costs was going up for everybody and people were, were getting really, really harmed by not having insight into low cost care pathways. And it troubled me very much because that is not, you know, my DNA. My DNA is to help people, not, not watch them get screwed, which is kind of what the managed care industry is all about. You know, so when the, the transparency law became effective on January 1st, <clears throat> I went head first into it, full steam. So let me let me just hit the pause there button, pause sure. button there for you, just to make everybody aware. What Leo is referring to is the Price Transparency Act that came in place and took effect on January one of this year. Right, it was passed under the prior administration and came into law on January one. And it, what does it require people to do, Leo? So it requires the hospitals to publish their negotiated rates and three hundred shoppable services, along with cash. So I, my, my intention is to build a national database where people can identify low cost. Whether they act on that or not is not my responsibility. My objective is just to inform them. People, you know, in a capitalistic society, people are allowed to spend more money if they want to. So I just want to supply people with low cost care pathways. So you're thinking the Price Transparency Act is here. I can develop this database. It's going to be straightforward, all sales full. Off we go. Off you're going to leave go. the great state, the, the great port of Philadelphia with a with a steamship full of opportunity. And how have people been complying with the Price Transparency Act? It's a mess. It is. It's a mess. It's it's willful. It's it's sabotage. It's it's data sabotage. And I fully it's, I fully expect it subterfuge in the way they presented the data files. And just, I'm sorry, one more, one more point to make sure everybody understands. The obligation is to put your prices for cash, Medicaid, Medicare, and the BUCAs all and online. Mm -hmm. And this is important in machine readable format. Yep. yep. So that anybody with a web scraper can go collect that data for the purposes of reintroducing this novel idea, it's only been around for 250 years called consumerism, 
back into the marketplace. So this, you here you are, you're thinking that you've now got a, a legal support system and regulations that are going to help you collect your data and, and facilitate comparison shopping and... Well, the, the hospitals certainly made machine readable files. What they also did was to make sure that the files weren't reusable. So meaning that you cannot just download a clean file and upload it to a server in like a smooth transaction because the way they structured the machine readable file is a bloody mess. And I have a experience as a programmer. So I know how to reverse engineer their sabotage. I'll call it sabotage because that's what it is. And, and reconstruct the file to be clean so that it can be uploaded to a server to aggregate it where now I can put the MSA on it, New York, Dallas, Florida, Los Angeles, any procedure code, and then poof, there is your cost variations for a specific hospital or amongst different hospitals within you know, any market you wish to observe. Um, so for the last, it's been an intense six months for me. Here we are June 30th, and I've been going really hard seven days a week, 78 hours a week, you know, not only researching these websites, trying to locate these files, which is no, um, it's not, it's not easy, but as you find it, you have to write programs to extract it and clean it up. So I'm finally finished, you know, um, it's been a lot of hard work and we're about to launch a website on Sunday which has over 2,400 hospitals aggregated, cleaned up, where anybody, you know, you have to, you have to buy access to the state. And then they can certainly download, you know, in small chunks, whatever data they wish to observe to identify low-cost care pathways. That's my objective. That's my aim. And, and, we're, so, and we're there. So aside from being outraged by uh management is there anything else that drives you with such passion to pursue this it, it other than the fundamental sense of right and wrong it, it was it was what i i was so naive working at the blue cross because i thought people had a moral compass and they don't once you're making the big bucks your moral compass i, I goes away for a lot of people because you you're you're happy with, you know, your, your paycheck getting is fat and you have a nice lifestyle and you're not doing anything to change that. But people are getting hurt and there's a higher calling to being a, a, a custodian of other people's money. And that just really pissed me off. And it just drives me to, so when I meet, when I open a file and I see that it's, it's all over the place, I know they did that to rip people off. They don't want this data reused because they're going to gouge. And, and so it's when just, you say they, you're referring to the, the hospitals. hospitals. Yeah. yeah, or the administrators. It's not right. the doctors, it's not the clinicians. It's yeah. the middlemen between the clinicians and the patients who are getting fat on the gravy in healthcare. Right. So when I meet these files and I see that they're bastardized, it, it pisses me off. And I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to fix this file. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Now, there's a very famous saying from uh, a senior executive, uh, and I want to say it was at Ascension, but I could have that wrong, who used to say, no margin, no mission. And the argument there is, hey, we're a not-for-profit, and we have to make money somehow in order to pay for all the indigent care that we provide, which is part of the reason we get the tax exemption that we do which comes in the form of things like relief from, and depending upon the state is different, but relief from you know, sales tax, use tax, franchise tax, property tax, et cetera. Right. And again, it, it differs all over the place. But so this is another way of just one could argue, what I, and what I, I think I, as implicit in your remarks is hiding margin. It's hiding profitability by obfuscator, making unclear what price really is and then charging something that's much greater than what should be the price. It, it, it is that, but I feel that there's so much waste in healthcare administration that hospitals could still 
provide the care they need to provide at a much lower cost. And that, but that cost is going to come at the expense of middlemen. And I just feel that you, hospitals will still make their money, but it's, it's the administration that is in jeopardy with price transparency because there's no administration when I need to go into Burger King and buy a hamburger. I know the price, I buy it, and, I'm, and that's the end of the transaction. But in healthcare, there's a whole – everybody's hands are in the cash register, and, and it's over with, with transparency. Now, there are a couple of things that come out of that for me. One is uh, obviously the, the issue that you're, you're raising, but um, the second issue is why aren't TPAs and insurance companies calling foul? Because they're getting a, their hands are in a cash register, and as as long as when the claim cost goes up, their 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 paychecks are getting filled. Because so it's a cost plus model, right? It, and the it premiums is. established with a loss ratio that's dictated by the state, and then you they they negotiate with the state department of insurance. And so, you know, one of the things that I pointed out in my book is that there's a belief that there's at least two hundred and fifty to to three hundred fifty billion dollars and fraud, waste, and abuse in healthcare every year. But that's not the staggering part of the story or the study. The staggering part of the study is that's excluding the $250 billion in administrative expenses. Yes. Right? Because they said that's too hard to look at. The study said, the, the people doing the study said that's too hard to look at. So yeah. it, it, what you're trying to do, nobly, I might add, is you're trying to tackle the 250 that was, quote, too hard to, to look at and go from there. Right. Now, I want to add on that, what you just said there. And this, this is another part that really pisses me off. When I was at you know, Blue Cross, and I, I, I created benchmarks, which, which, which identified bad billers or expensive billers, as well as good billers. It's a benchmark. Somebody's favorable, somebody's unfavorable. So I'm in the fraud division, and I'm in doing a, a town hall in a room of like 70 people showing you know, the billing abuse. And one of the managers raised her hand, raised his hand, and he says to me in front of everybody, how do we get our recovery if doctors stop billing bad? We're supposed to be managing costs and using the data to make – if the consumer is the center of everything we do, we're supposed to be using the data to make sure that they're protected, not, not using the data as a weapon to get a recovery so I can get my bonus. And that is what really upset me. And everybody in the room thought the same thing. Nobody thought, shame on you for not having that moral compass to doing what's right and wrong. It's how am I going to get my recovery if, if we right. share the data and doctors stop billing bad? And I'm like, this is a messed up system. And, so um, let me ask you this: Where do you get your data? And I know you obviously are compiling huge ingest and huge amounts of data on a daily basis. How, where do you get your data? The websites, the hospital websites. Okay, and then you're just cleaning up the data. I download them. We we run them through programs. We have um a script. And, you know, we have like a like, a, like yeah. a dozen scripts, and I say, you know, this file use script one. This file use script eight, and then um. So pretty much those those like ten scripts will fit any one of the different data presentations I may meet, and right. so we we just download them, we scrub them, we load them, download them, scrub them, load them, again and again and again. I understand. So let me ask you this: There's a whole other thing that's just happened that most people aren't aware of, which is that a study came out. I think it was yesterday, or the day before, that said that now over fifty percent of all practicing physicians in the United States are employed by hospitals. I believe it. So tell me what you think about that. The hospitals know there's more margin when I buy more clinicians and charge a higher rate per unit. And so they get away with it. And, and I guess, you know, another part of it is that the insurance companies create a lot of abrasion with denials and prior offs which burns out doctors. So they're like, I'm, I'm, I give up. I can't fight these managed care companies anymore. If this hospital has the administration staff to fight back and, and re- diminish my burden, sign me up. When do I start working for you? But 
with price transparency, you're going to have a lot of doctors go non-par. They're going to be like, look, I can get more money rate per unit than being par and dealing with your provider abrasion. So I feel that it's, it's, it's going to transform the whole industry, price transparency. It really is. Assuming we get there. Well, we're here. We're having in, Jan- in six months, we have a transparency and coverage coming out where the carriers had to publish every doctor's negotiated rate. Um, and, and they had to supply the, the codes build to the consumers before treatment. So there goes your payment integrity. Once, because once consumers have the codes, once the code consumer knows what codes will be billed, they can decline treatment or shop somewhere else. That there's no overpayments when the patient knows the cost of care before treatment is rendered. Right. There goes your payment integrity. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the other point there is not only do can they can they further obfuscate pricing, but they also control the entire referral network. Right. Yep. Yeah. So can... it, it's it's going to be a vicious war in the managed care space, as far as you know, hospitals controlling doctors, and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly being a clinician and, a, and an administrator in healthcare. You know, starting right now, maybe starting getting ugly, but January first, it's going to get really ugly. So there's there's a correction coming. You you know, implicit in what you're saying is that there are different prices. Within the same uh, carrier, definitely at different systems for the same service. Yes. Okay. So now the question becomes: That being the case, who should care about that? Because the insurance companies are getting, and to some extent, they're just not negotiating consistently across the platform. No. So that's on the carriers. But the reality is that most companies have some element of self-insurance before you get to the carrier stepping up and assuming the risk. And if that's the case, then the, the folks who ought to be most concerned about this are not necessarily the employees because they're paying a copay or a deductible and not necessarily the carriers, but the folks who seems to me to ought to be most interested in this are and most concerned about it are the employers absolutely, and the TPAs. Absolutely. If they're doing their job, they ought to be saying, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. You know, yes, we're administering the claim. Yes, it qualifies, but this doesn't make any walking around sense from a pricing perspective. No. And we are beholden, the third party administrator is beholden, I would assume, to the employer who's paying the third party administrator's bills, right? Right. So so my my response to that question would be if if it falls on the employer because, you know, what they could say, they could go like uh, Orlando. They could say they could identify the lowest price point for any treatment within or the Orlando, Orlando MSA and say, hey, employees, this is how much I'm going to pay 100%. If you want to go to a more expensive hospital, you pay the difference. But I'm only paying the lowest rate or maybe the average at the bottom three, you know, this is the max I'm paying for this treatment because you, you can, you're aware of lower cost alternatives and you're welcome to choose uh, and a more expensive hospital. You're allowed to do that, but I'm not paying for your, you know, your wishes. I'm paying for your care, not what you want, what you want I'm paying for your care. So they could make their own limited network or, or I'm not, I shouldn't say limited network. They can say, I'm only reimbursing the minimum amount in this market. Or the or the bottom five rates in a market, and the employees can accept that as free money and healthcare for free. But if they want to go to a more expensive hospital; they can do that. So it's so, I, it's, it's them. And one of the emerging trends now, and we've seen a lot of this. I had a guest on my last podcast uh, from Carum Health, and what they're doing is they're bundling services, meaning as the you know, as the intermediary, they're going off and negotiating prices and saying, you know, I, I'm concerned about quality of service and I'm also concerned about price, but I'm going to put together the price for the facility fee, the anesthesiologist, the right. surgeon, uh, the pre-op and the post-op. And I'm going to put that all into one price and it's going to be less than the sum of all prices that you're paying currently. What do you think about that? I, I understand the logic behind it. I'm not a fan of it. Because it takes away competition from healthcare. 
So if you're bundling a rate for $1,600 for colonoscopy, well, maybe with provider competition, the colonoscopy might drop to $900. But because you price fixed this treatment at $1,600, you remove market forces from you know, discovering the true price of healthcare. So I'm not a fan of bundling, even though I understand why people would find it attractive. If you're going to bundle, let provider com competition come in first, reset prices, and then if you want to reduce the administrative cost for coding, where it may be, then you bundle. But you can't bundle when you have price distortions. That's stupid. <laughs> and I think what you're really saying is, especially price distortions of this magnitude. Yes. Why would you bundle when you have price distortions? That's illogical. Let provider competition come in and reset prices to, to the bare bottom or wherever the market equilibrium lands. And then once it lands, then you bundle, not before. But isn't it the case that what you're making certain is that you're not paying out of network fees for certain things and you're not paying inflated physician fees and inflated facilities fees. You're, the bundle in and of itself in the aggregate is still going to be a lower price. So that's if one could argue that's- You hope, you hope. Yeah, you hope that it, the bundled rate is lower than the aggregate. But what I'm saying is that nobody knows the cost of healthcare because it's been in a vacuum for the last 30 years. Right. It needs to come, it needs to reset. And then let the, let the market reset itself and then if you want to come in and rebundle, do it. But, you know, building a house on quicksand is, is, is not what you want to do. Let the, let the foundation settle, and then you want to build your house. And in your view, how long will that take? Once you release your uh, service offering mm -hmm. uh, and others try and replicate or mimic it in some way, what will, how long do you think it'll take for prices to stabilize? Um, I, I kind of think maybe three years, three years, you know, but like, like, again, that, like what I need right now is, is, um, mobilization for my, my data. You know, I'm just a programmer, a, a data, a fee schedule guy who built a platform. You know, I have to bring this into the homes of America to make people aware that there's ways to find low cost pathways. And until I, if, if I get some, a supercharged uh, advertising company who can accelerate that, maybe it's two years, but I, 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 I'm not there yet. I'm just building this data, but I need that partnership to, to who can do that acceleration, that market acceleration, because I can't. But if, if we did have this acceleration and people adopted, you know, shop, you know, consumerism, I think three years, you will have prices reset. And there's going to be a lot of pain because a lot of healthcare is four trillion and a lot of billions is going to come out of healthcare. So there's going to be a lot of pain in the administration world. So who's your ideal customer? Is it an individual or is it an employer or is it a TPA or is it a brokerage firm or is it a carrier? It, 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 it's everybody. But Really, the way the way my, my DNA works is that the consumer decides where they want to buy care. Okay, there's no there's no TPAs and administrators in fast food or theme park industries. All right, if I want to go to Disney World, I know I have to pay 110 bucks a ticket, you know, for a family for for one day, and I can decide if I want to spend that much money. And if I can't, I might go to Bush Gardens. I don't need an administrator to tell me I can't afford Disney World. Um, so, so really, the purchasing power of healthcare should rest with the consumer. That, that's where it belongs. Not with the employer, even though they're also a median between the consumer and healthcare. It comes back to the consumer. So ultimately, it falls on them. But to, and it's going to take some correction and some weird pathways to get to the consumer. Um, but that's where it rests. And everybody between the consumer and the clinician is administration. So let me challenge the idea that it's the consumer in that 
the consumer doesn't really pay the bill. The consumer pays the copay or the deductible. So well, there's, there's no incentive for the consumer to reduce, to no, seek a reduced price. I, I, I don't, I understand where it's coming from. I don't entirely accept it because your, your copay is based on how much premium you're paying. If you're paying 2000 a month, your copay is 10 bucks per visit. If you're paying, you know, $400 a month, your copay is $200. So you're not getting away without skin in the game because whatever you pay at the clinician's desk, you're paying somebody else in the premiums. So there is certainly um, pain on both ends of the cost spectrum. Yeah, but the problem is, is that the, neither the individuals nor the employers actually get to negotiate premium. That's determined by the State Department of Insurance. There's certainly um, going to be a difficult way to stand this up, but I think that the, we have to get the data out there, and 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 I feel that if if I'm an employer, I'm saying, and I'm in the Philly area, I'm saying here's the the amount I'm paying 100%. If you want no call, if you want no out of pocket, more money in your paycheck, you go to these hospitals where I'm paying 100%. And if you want to, you know, go beyond that, it's all on you. Um, but then ultimately, once the consumer accepts that this is a, a, an appropriate pathway, the employer can say, I'm out of the health insurance business. Here's your, um, the money I paid to the premiums. Here is your, Back to you, and now you can do whatever you want. So in that instance, I think we're we're agreed in that it's really the employer. It's the employer. It's the employer, but really, they're still they're even the middleman because they're not. Right. They're even the middleman. It's the consumer and the clinician. Right. And and, and once so we what, it, what we really ought to be driving to is is a more pure form of consumerism where. If you go to the doctor, you pay for the doctor yourself, and that is uh, done ideally at a rate that's established in your database, right? In Health Cost Labs database, because that's going to be the low, theoretically the lowest price. But if you take the consumer out of it, and you have one or more middlemen. It's it's all everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Quickly, it does. It does. So, so so really, I think that. Employers would love to get out of the health insurance business, but they can't, they need to protect their employees from harm. But price transparency removes the harm. It's just more about education. Right. But I think the, the thing I really take away from our conversation is that it's really the employers that ought to be laser focused on this issue. And then crafting their plans and communicating with their employees, also known as their insureds, to make certain that they're fully equipped to make good decisions based on having a full complement of data with which to make those decisions and on which to base those decisions. Yeah. So I, I am I am standing up a platform that can have that can support that conversation. The industry is, well, at least some of us in the industry are grateful for your hard work and your passion. Uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, how do they do that? On Sunday, um, they can come into my website and they can, you know, create an account and then they can pick whichever state they want, you know, buy now, add to your shopping cart, input your credit card or your bank card, um, and then boof, you're you're in business. We're, we're uh, I'm your, we're, we're, we're. Uh, you're my client or you're my customer. So, and that's at healthcostlabs.com, right? Yes. That's what Please. I was looking. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, healthcostlabs.com. It's coming Sunday. So it, it's clear that uh, you're long on passion and, and long on uh, on coding. And we, we can help buff and polish you a little bit on the sales side. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I need a lot of that. <laughs> Leah, I am so grateful for the time to visit with you today. It's been just an absolute joy. And I, I hope that I can have you back on the on the podcast at some point in the future so I can hear how, how much success you've enjoyed. Thank you. It's my pleasure to join you. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Civil Discourse. 
To learn more about today's topic or our guest, visit www.the60percentsolution.com or www.tfip.group.